Good morning, and thanks for joining us, everybody. My name is Joe Kozlowitz. I'm the content manager here at Greenhouse Data. And today we're going to be talking about different types of modular design in the data center. Just a quick bit of, of housekeeping. Our presentation will last until 10.30, at which point we'll field some questions. If you have to jump off early, we will be sending everyone an email with a recording of the presentation. Um, our featured speakers today are Rob Nash-Boulden, Managing Director at Dearns America, and Sean Mills, President and CEO of Greenhouse Data. Thank you both in advance for your insights, and let's get started. Well, great. Uh, my name is Sean Mills. I'm the President and CEO of Greenhouse Data. Greenhouse Data is a co-location and cloud hosting company with uh, locations in seven different markets around the country, from New York, New Jersey, Portland, Oregon, and three locations in Washington, as well as two of the data centers, and one of which we'll be looking at today uh, in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm Rob Nash-Bolden. I'm the Managing Director for Dearns America. Uh, Dearns is a consulting engineering firm. We specialize in mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineering. We have about 600 engineers around the world and 22 offices in 15 countries. Um, I'm the managing director here in America, and we were the design engineers for the Greenhouse Data Project in, uh, in Cheyenne and also in New York. Great. A couple of things that we looks like we were going to uh, review today is how is modularity different from traditional builds, prefabricated components, and containerized data centers? We're going to chat a little bit about the advantages and some of the things that we looked at in our process at Greenhouse Data as we were building out our last couple of data center facilities, and how how we planned and, and talked in, about the uh, future densities, and as we were looking at trying to understand what our, our unknown tenant was going to require of us, we worked very closely with Rob at, at Dearns to help us understand some of those. It's, it's um, as Sean kind of said, that, um, that discussion around who's going to come, and how do we plan for that is a, was an exhaustive one and, a, and a, a big, long process for us. We spent a lot of time looking at a lot of options. We're going to talk about some of that today and kind of just characterize or explain for everyone the process that we went through on this particular project and how it might even apply to other projects or facilities. So as we were planning for the future uh, and, and really an unknown future for our, our data center design, we had to take a lot of different um, components and, and different challenges in mind uh, as we were trying to design that. And so we literally looked at all of the various options. We looked at everything from containerized data centers to a stick-built data center to prefabricated data centers. And really, you know, from a service provider's perspective, and I think what's really happening in, in the space today is that uh, flexibility is critical for the data center design. And so, you know, as we were trying to figure out how do we maximize our flexibility for, for our potential new clients that could literally be anywhere from 1 kW of load in a, in a cabinet to 12 kW uh, or higher load? How, how can we handle that? And so, you know, being able to scale quickly both up, down, uh, move loads around the, the data center floor was really important as we were trying to plan for the future that is completely unknown. I think the, the challenge that you're explaining, Sean, is, is um, a common one for multi-tenant data center providers, co-location providers, if you will, in that um, the basis of design, the time that you spend identifying those parameters and sort of developing the size of your box, if you will, the area in which you'll be most able to operate, is integral to that process. We, um, I remember spending a lot of time going over that talking about how we could shift things, move things, balance things, um, just how much flexibility could we have and, and how much can we afford to have. Um, it's, it's, not an unlimited, uh, it's not an unlimited budget project and we want to scale to the market uh, today and tomorrow. So that basis of design and development of those criteria was, at least in my mind, was one of the maybe early and critical components to our success. 
so as we were going through the process of really trying to understand you know where that load was going to come from and, and how big of a building should we build what are the components to that building you know we, we looked very early on at uh, a modular and or prefab design through the process and so um, you know as we were going through our analysis of of how do we accomplish this uh, quite challenging puzzle of, of de designing and developing for this l incredibly unknown um, load. It's interesting looking back now that it's proving to be true that we had no idea. <laughs> we could have designed for 5KW or 7KW or 12KW and we would have been wrong. So whatever metric we used we knew was going to be wrong and so it was really critical and why we ultimately kind of came down for, to this modular approach was so that we could have a more quick deployment inside of our data center facility for that unknown amount of load that the costs could be minimized you know the worst thing we could do is strand a massive amount of capacity uh, in a given section of a data center or even for that matter in a portion of a data center that ultimately drives up the cost per KW in our facility and so for us that flexibility was was vital uh, to, to delivering only what our clients need and, and not have them have to pay for something that they didn't. Especially in the multi-tenant data center environment, that flexibility is vital, as you said. And from a design perspective, what we really see is a really a disappearing set of lines between these, what we would call stick-built, uh, modular, prefabricated, containerized uh, from a from a design engineer standpoint virtually every client we talk to mentions all of those items and is really sort of looking for the right combination for their project of those different components invariably um, all of the projects have a bit of all of those elements or want to have the flexibility to have them uh, you know in your case we don't have any containerized solutions, but we thought about and talked about could we roll one up? Um, how could we deploy one if we needed to? Um, using the CFD studies to look at what would happen if we did this in, in this hall and um, how would we be able to accommodate those kinds of loads if we, you know, you got an RFP that you wanted to respond to that was um, a little bit different than what we'd originally envisioned. Yeah, I would probably add on that the, the CFD study. You know, the CFD study was definitely a critical component to, as, as we continue through this presentation, we'll get a little bit more specific about how we built what we built. But um, doing those CFD studies in advance and doing multiple renditions to prove out our theory of how modular we could be through our design so that we could then know, all right, if we deliver 1KW into this pod, 2KW, 3KW into this pod, right next to a 12KW pod, what happens? And so those CFD studies were absolutely critical for us to help understand what that fle what flexibility would we have in our ultimate design and as we continued to look at all the different options, how we could maximize that flexibility was definitely critical for our modular design. So as, as a consulting engineer, we're, we're the guide through that process. We, we listen to your wish list, we talk about advantages, disadvantages, and ramifications of each decision and help clients like you make an educated decision um, so that you know what you've decided upon and what you'll be able to do. That, that's sort of what the consulting engineer's role is in that, in that process. So as we, we were going through this process, and Rob has done, I know, uh, a ton of data centers around the world. He could probably speak to more than just our uh, data center design, but we were we looked at all of the various options, literally from a containerized solution to traditional stick-built methods of all right, let's tilt up walls, uh, build out the data center, uh, and, and go to okay, what how would a prefab or how would a containerized solution look or or, or, or be deployed in, in our environment? And, you know, we, we did look very closely and absolutely considered, okay, because we have an unknown tenant, we have no idea what they're going to bring. So if someone wants to bring a container to our data center, how could we hook it up? Where would it land on our, on our um, space? Uh, how would we plug it in? 
how we connect it to the uh, redundant water, redundant cooling, redundant electricity. So we've we considered all of those, and and ultimately what we chose was the stick built method, because. Um, but the challenge with the stick built method is there is an ultimate and finite uh, design criteria. So we can design it as flexible as we uh, can envision. But really, at the end of the day, there is always a max load. Once you build four walls, there is ultimately, at some point, a max load based on the design that we ultimately create. And to your point, stick built is still modular. Uh, so even though it was built in a traditional fashion, there were many assembled, pre-assembled, pre-manufactured components. There were um, tilt-up precast concrete elements with, um, with our, our punch-outs for our indirect evaporative cooling units in the future. Um, stick build and modular go hand in hand. And ultimately, while that was the right decision for this project, um, it, it doesn't mean that stick build isn't modular. It means that um, there's a variety of ways, and those lines are actually pretty blurry. Um, the ability for us to accommodate this set of criteria and the unknown tenant was what we were shooting for, and and um, stick build achieves that. In your experience, Rob, how um, are there? How did we differ from other people that you've worked with in, in the selection process between those two? So one of the um, you know one of the greatest advantages of the greenhouse project in Cheyenne, Sean, is that it was a greenfield project. So we had the opportunity to do a lot of things. Um, when you ask about experience with other clients, there's a, there's a fair amount of repurposing of industrial buildings and other facilities out there that sometimes um, limit your choices a little bit more. You may not have the structural integrity to, to place the types of equipment that you'd like on the site or on the roof. And so in Cheyenne, is a wonderful opportunity because we had a, a greenfield site and really could uh, could design just what you wanted. So I think that's where we usually will run into some constraints and some areas where we can't use all of the approaches because we have some uh, some vertical, horizontal, or or pre-built construction constraint that prohibits us from changing everything. So as we went through this process. Uh, just to give a little insight of what we built, uh, we built out a, a 35,000 square foot data center facility, uh, and we, we were basically trying to match an unknown amount of demand, an unknown amount of capacity, uh, and so we at, at some level had to put a stake in the ground that said, all right, well, what are you going to build at the very macro level? And so we chose to build a four megawatt facility um, and we were fortunate that a 4 megawatt of IT load facility in Cheyenne, Wyoming meant only a 5 megawatt load of uh, cooling and IT load. And so with our modular uh, design, uh, we basically built it out into to four modules, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. And so we were very fortunate to be able to literally start from, you know, dirt and design what we thought uh, would would meet the needs uh, of our clients, and so ultimately, what we did was we designed for a max capacity of uh, 5.6 kW per cabinet, um, but with the ability uh, to, you know, as clients came in, cage space took up more uh, square footage than we had anticipated, and that now allows us to add much higher density clients into our facilities and shift load throughout each of those phases. And so the nice thing about the modular design is that there, we will not be, uh, we will most likely not strand any capacity uh, ever. And then we will know by phase four exactly how to match exactly the capacity of the clients that came in with the design that, that we had. And so we were able to put our uh, AC units, which are the gray boxes around the perimeter on the outside of the building, uh, and, and able to just continually add them as demand dictated. And same with um, the other components of the facility. It's, it's important to understand this, um, this planning. Um, the amount of electrical conduit planning that we, um, that we provided in terms of 
being able to move electrical capacity from hall to hall to accommodate this dynamic load balancing. The, the, the way in which we ducted the facility in order to move air from hall to hall without a raised floor um, is, um, is also an important design consideration. Um, the, the location of your meet-me rooms that allow for the connectivity to travel between the halls, um, it, all of those elements um, are just really part of that pre-planning modular design element that, that helps you prepare. Yeah, and you know, I think, you know, hitting on what Rob had just mentioned, <laughs> at the time it felt like we were spending an exorbitant amount of time on the pre-planning, uh, but the nice thing about the pre-planning phase and the time that we spent uh, working with our design engineers uh, at, at Deerns was super important to the success of our facility if we miss, right? So all of the pre-planning that we put in, in up front on the design of the gen sets of the electrical infrastructure of the UPS design, literally down to the conduits, which how they connected back to the electrical infrastructure now is giving us that ultimate modular uh, capabilities of precisely matching the demand with uh, our capacity. Let me ask you a quick question on that, sort of on that topic, Sean. Are you, do you see a, a trend towards smaller suites and modules? This, are, are clients asking about this flexibility and ability to expand? What, what do clients come to Greenhouse for? Well, one of the nice things, uh, <laughs> the reality is, Builds are much more dense now than they, they, they were in the past. And so we're seeing much more dense, concise builds into smaller spaces. And so that's why we had designed this, you know, we're designing this four megawatt facility into really a small number of square feet because the densities are going up from our clients and they're trying to put more um, heat load in a given square foot than they had in the past. I think industry-wide that, that seems to be a trend. There's a lot of education. Um, cloud and disaster recovery sites have really modified organizational goals to a point where these smaller suites and modules seem to be the trend, at least in the market that we see. And it, it seems like you're, you know, you're well positioned to pick that up. And so as we uh, look down inside of our building, we, we went all the way down to a pod design. So you, as you saw in the previous slide, we had the four phases, which you could consider rooms, uh, that were broken out into physical components inside of our building of about approximately 5,000 square feet each. And then again, to maximize that modular approach, we have designed pods, as you see in the picture in the top right corner, that could be of various um, number of cabinets. So they could be a 10 cabinet pod, a 36 cabinet pod, for that matter, a, a, a five cabinet pod. So I've got a quick question here. Um, someone's wondering who is the manufacturer on the pods? So on the pods, uh, we designed these pods uh, ourselves. So the, the pod itself inside the data center floor is a, is a combination of uh, various cabinet manufacturers. Uh, and then we work to secure these pods with uh, door enclosures as well as uh, secure enclosures that go from the top of the cabinets to the ceiling. And so these pods were, were um, self-designed using various components from, from different manufacturers. It seemed to you, Sean, that in, in these modular pods um, that containment, as you're talking about, is is something that clients ask for, ask about. I know we see it a lot in design. Folks ask us about hot aisle and cold aisle, the difference in efficiencies, um, you know, the challenges with pulling through telecommunications interconnects through, um, through you know, containment barriers. How, how do you address those types of things when you get down to the, the cabinet and rack level? So down at the, the cabinet and rack level, we literally try to match very specifically. This is where really the rubber meets the road. Our client comes to us and says, hey, we need 100 kW pod, and we think we need 10 cabinets to meet that load. We then design that so that we can be the most energy efficient. So with our building design, 
these these modular pods not only provide additional levels of security for our clients, but really do that hot aisle, cold aisle separation. So, you know, this facility in Cheyenne, Wyoming, uses zero mechanical cooling throughout the entire year. So it's really critical that we don't allow any of the hot air to mix with the cold air so that we can meet the uh, energy efficiency requirements. In this design that we have designed here, uh, we operate at about, you know, as we said, a 4 megawatt um, facility has a peak PUE of 1.25 because we only have one more megawatt of uh, for cooling ultimately inside the facility. And so on average, it's operating at about a 1.14. And so to be that low, you can't have hot air mixing with cold air. But then absolutely have to build in the flexibility for network components inside these, uh, bringing in the networking and, and um, electrical capacity and redundancy into the pods. From a from the design perspective, these efficiencies in pod design and and efficiencies in cooling technologies have made it uh, possible for folks with facilities that were not purpose built or maybe are a bit less sophisticated to achieve some of the same energy efficiencies that folks like Greenhouse enjoy in Cheyenne. That that pod as a building block of uh, of modular design is one that, again, we see across the industry, and, um, and it's a strong trend, including that, that trend toward containment that you talked about. Got one more quick question on the pods before we move on, and that is, you mentioned we don't have a raised floor. Is the airflow coming from the ceiling and then returning below the plenum? There's, and also, there's no in-row cooling, correct? So in our facility, there is no in-row cooling. So all of the cooling, uh, is distributed, as we kind of referenced a little bit earlier, through a common plenum so that we can move, add heat load, or add cooling components to the exterior of the building to then add additional cooling to any component on either of our first two phases. And so the supply comes in overhead and is ducted down into the rows, and then the return is a common plenum return back to the units uh, themselves. That's it. I was going to say it's uh, ducted supply, plenum return, uh, hot aisle containment. And so that we can match that load, right? So we, we're able to then, you know, because we don't have a raised floor, one of the challenges of not having a raised floor is the ability to move loads around. And so we've tried to maximize that capability by being able to duct and move air throughout the, uh, each phase of the design. With, um, with our dampering strategy, um, we can move air from hall to hall, side to side, um, using that large common headered plenum that distributes air for the whole facility and then those distribution trunks. But we could add in-row cooling. Um, Sean, we could have in-row cooling if we needed a, a space for a high-density client. Yeah. Great. So from a, um, electrical or mechanical? Mechanical. So from a mechanical perspective, as we were just referring, uh, we, we had uh, these building blocks. And as you can see, these massive uh, cooling units that were uh, pre-manufactured um, at the, the, the manufacturer of these units, we were able to deploy these as needed. So again, the, our, the modular design concept literally goes from every design component, from electrical to mechanical, to floor layout, to power capacity throughout the floor and on the floor. And so we're able to deploy these as needed, and we're able to put these into that common plenum so that we can continue to add. And one of the nice things about this, and we've already, our building's one, one year old, right? So we deployed four of these units day one, and now we've already started adding additional units as we've continued to grow, and this modular uh, approach allows us to take advantage of technology changes. And so these units have now already become more energy efficient, and, and so we're able to take advantage of the latest, greatest technology. You know, from a design perspective, you're also able to, to take advantage of changes in um, standards or requirements such as TC 9.9. Um, as humidity requirements change, as inlet temperature requirements change, or even your SLAs to your clients, um, you know, become from concept to uh, to contract. You're able to to um, using your indirect evaporative solution. You're able to accommodate those changes, both in a increasing capacity and decreasing capacity, 
increasing temperature, decreasing temperature in all throughout all of the components. Do the same with humidity. We can um, we can do the same on the humidity side and accommodate anything from five to eighty percent. Right. Right. So from an electrical perspective, again, this was really important on the modular side of the equation. One of the biggest cost components to the data center facility is not stranding electrical capacity. Being able to tightly match the redundancy requirements of our customers with uh, the capacity requirements so that we're not stranding you know, a megawatt of UPS load or stranding a megawatt of generator load. So we designed to an N plus one. We can also, with this modular design, if a client comes in and says, hey, I need a two N design, we can bring in components into various phases of our building because of the modular building blocks that we chose to deliver a two N requirement, an N plus one requirement, an N plus two requirement. We have ultimate flexibility when you get the building blocks right. Good, we, remember we spent hours, days, weeks talking about AB and ABC distributions. I mean, heck, you could be single corded um, if, if you want. Um, there's an awful lot of flexibility there and that's just part of that planning process. Yeah, and for, you know, from the ele uh, electrical side of the equation, you know, we spent a ton of time because for us in, in meeting our clients load, you know, when we strand capacity, we have to charge more. Uh, you know, if somebody comes in and wants 3KW, we can support them because we are not overbuilding. We're able to match their capacities. If they come in and, and want 10 or 12KW, we can again match exactly that capability and that capacity. And so as we, uh, you know, we're really looking through this process of trying to accommodate the unknown tenant, working closely with our design engineers putting in a ton of time up front was critical to our ultimate success as we build throughout that facility. I think for, um, for Dearns, this, um, this was one of the most enjoyable projects I can think of in that uh, some clients kind of have it all figured out and they come to the table knowing what they want. They've got a defined program. Um, Greenhouse's approach to explore the options and engage the consulting engineer in those discussions and education to, um, to help you make good decisions is, uh, is a fun role for us. So that was, um, those discussions that we talked about were all, uh, were all pretty enjoyable from our perspective. Cool, thank you both. Um, we're right at 10.30. As I said, if you need to hop off, we'll be sending out a recording. Um, but if you have questions, we have a couple that have come in and definitely uh, go ahead and ask them in the question area on GoToWebinar here. Um, so to start with, um, back on the cooling, someone was wondering, do you have anything that, that shows the pressurized plenum or have you just kind of moved the raised floor above the ceiling? They're unclear how that's different. So in essence, it is kind of a moving the raised floor above the ceiling. There's a supply. Well, we specifically moved the raised floor to the wall. So our common supply is against the wall so that that in essence acts like our supply plenum or the floor in a traditional raised floor environment. And then the return tr traditionally is up in the air above the ceiling and returned back to crack units. Ours happens to be above the ceiling and returns back to our indirect evaporative cooling units. It's a bunch of, it's a lot of four foot duct that circulates around the perimeter of the facility, um, coming in off the supply side of the indirect evaporative units, and then trunks out and branches out. So um, to, the, to the participant's question, really the, um, the raised floor got moved to the common header. The plenum became the ducted header that then delivers the supply to the rows. How does the cost and like time to build out the next phase compare then versus having the raised floor? So we did a lot of work looking at raised floor and no raised floor environments and, and you know we found in our environment that this was the most effective cost approach to delivering the solution. You know when you get to a raised floor environment you then have to now have um, grounding in your raised floor, you have to obviously pay for the raised floor. 
You also have to put fire suppression under the raised floor. So there are a lot of hidden components to a raised floor that in our analysis, uh, we, we found that in this design, uh, the flexibility, speed, and cost uh, made sense for us to not have a raised floor. I think Greenhouse was an, one of the early adopters of that philosophy, um, even in your first data center. And as a designer, we see a strong trend away from design uh, that designs that include raised floor. Um, there, there's still a lot of raised floor out there and folks that are still designing with it to just sort of, because of the unknown tenant and maybe because that's something people expect to see when they walk into a data hall, there's still a lot of folks rolling that out and, and using that under floor plenum for their cabinet distribution. Um, we do see a trend away for sure. On the electrical, someone was wondering about your distribution to the rack and whether it's routed bus bar or dropped into the module. So we have a routed uh, approach from our RPP or PDU overhead to each of the uh, cabinets themselves. So as part of our design, we um, we did an, as Rob alluded to, we did an ABC and actually a D leg of our uh, design so that we could either bring an A and a B, an A and a C, an A and a D to any of our individual cabinets to ultimately provide a fully concurrently maintainable infrastructure where entire lineup of electrical infrastructure could go uh, kaput and our facility would stay up. We've got RPPs and WIPs essentially that are routed directly to the cabinets, and that's where the circuits for the cabinets, uh, the cabinet PDUs connect. That's good. Uh, we have question? one one final question here that is, uh, what has the client response been to the lack of mechanical cooling? So really, at the end of the day, we, we've, we have had a track record in our first facility using similar technologies, not to this scale or not to this um, capacity. Um, that has proven that the climate in, in Cheyenne with the design that we've come up with uh, is 365 days a year, not, not requiring any mechanical cooling. And so, you know, really it comes down to the data. It's the data that we're showing our temperature and humidity probes matches the standards from the client's perspective. They don't really care what, the, what type of cooling it is as long as it provides the right amount of cooling to their racks. Seems like a lot of the feedback that I hear is is positive in that that energy efficient cooling distribution um, is, can be reflected in the pricing to some extent. So a lot of your folks that that we've heard from have said um, not only does it meet the requirement, but it's cost effective. Well, that's all the questions we have right now. If anyone wants to get one in, now's the time. Um, otherwise, we've got our contact information up here on screen. Feel free to visit our website, uh, shoot us an email, or of course, uh, everyone's all about social media these days. So uh, thank you all for attending. John, Rob, thank you guys very much. Um, and have a great day.